Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be just in section 63 of the Doctrine and Covenants. There are so many things happening in this section, aren't there, Bryce? Yes, and notice we're back in Kirtland, Ohio. Now, do you remember in the New Testament where Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration and was transfigured in front of them, and they heard the voice of God, and Moses and Elijah was there, and many other wonderful people were there, and they had this out-of-earth experience where they got to see Jesus in all of his glory, and then they came down from the mountain to the reality of mortal life, and they found that the disciples struggled to get an evil spirit cast out of a boy and had felt like they had failed. Jesus came back to that situation, came down from being in heaven down to the reality of mortality. And section 63 is kind of like that. Joseph's been up to Jackson County and clearly saw in vision Zion. I just don't doubt for a second that the Lord showed Joseph the glory of Zion. And now he's back to the reality of the road we're going to have to go down to get there. And it's a mess. One of the missionaries that Joseph took to Zion was Ezra Booth. And he did not see the glory of Zion. And he's starting to not see the glories of God and the glories of the church. And he's kind of becoming a doubter. And he's asking more and more frequently to see signs. And so that kind of leads us into section 63, where the Lord's going to talk about not seeking signs. You know, Bryce, so many people, for example, Joseph Fielding Smith said that this revelation is all about the saints knowing, okay, we found Zion. What are we to do? That's kind of the big question of this section. You read through it. And they're so excited about what to do. And then the Lord is just like, there's so many things to fix. (laughs) You guys are messed up. In this section, he's kind of getting on them, right? Yeah. It's imagine you, you have these plans for this beautiful garden and someone drew you a picture of this incredible garden. And then you go out and see the reality of the weeds that you have to clear out in order to get there. And that's kind of section 63, is we've seen the vision of Zion, and now let's start to deal with the weeds that we have to get rid of in order to have this beautiful garden. It's almost like he's yelling at the weeds, calling them bee seeds, and it's pretty rough. But right from the beginning of this section, he's talking about them as wicked and rebellious, verse 2. Uh, Talking about casting some of them down to hell, verse 4. I mean, and then verse 6, let the wicked take heed. And let the rebellious fear and tremble. And then he starts talking about signs. And that's where I think Ezra Booth is coming into play. Now, he's not calling out Ezra Booth by name. But historically, it's at about this time when he gets back from Missouri and he starts to be disaffected. So if you look in verse 8, there are those among you who seek signs. And then in verse 9, it says, Behold, faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe. Yea, signs come by faith. And I think the real rebuke is in verse 12, where he says, I, the Lord, am not pleased with those among you who have sought after signs and wonders for faith. For faith. In other words, prove to me that it's true. Prove to me with something magical, something grandiose. Prove to me with something of a sign, and then I'll believe. And that's very different than those who are going to believe no matter what, and then the Lord sends the signs to confirm their belief. Because he does. He does confirm belief. So back in verse 9, faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe. If you need a sign in order to convince you that it's true, then that's not going to lead you to faith. That's not going to lead you down the path of conversion. But that doesn't mean signs are empty from our lives. Signs happen all the time, and signs are given to confirm the belief of those who would believe even if the sign didn't come. 
I think the real rebuke here is, I'm not pleased with those of you who are seeking signs for faith. And I know he's not using Ezra Booth, but knowing the history, he sure seems to be pointing at those type of people who are now saying, hey, I need to see more than just ordinary human beings, ordinary piece of land out in Missouri in order for me to really believe that this is a divine thing. It'd be really awesome if we could interview Ezra Booth. We can't. But this is the beginning to align himself with the saints. And there's a couple of different accounts that we have. I'll just give you Philo Dibble's account, and then you can go and read, like, for example, we have one from Amos Hayden, and another great historian, Susan Easton Black, has done some great work collecting some of these. So we've got it all out there. But this is Philo Dibble. Now, Philo Dibble, he's right there with the saints, and he's associated with the Johnsons at this time. So Elsa and John Johnson, they own a very prosperous farm in Hiram, Ohio. Joseph Smith is going to live there for about a year after this event. But when Joseph comes to Kirtland, people are talking about him. And there's a big buzz about the Book of Mormon and about a modern prophet. And Elsa Johnson, who is John's wife, she has this arm that she's not able to use. She just couldn't use it. In fact, Philo Dibble says he calls it a crooked arm. And according to his words, this is his account, that she persuaded her husband to take her to Kirtland to get her arm healed. And then Philo says, I saw them as they passed my house on their way. She, Elsa Johnson, went to Joseph and requested him to heal her. Joseph asked her if she believed the Lord was able to make him an instrument in healing her arm. And she said that she believed that that was so. So the next morning, when he met her at Newell K. Whitney's house, there were about eight people there. And Ezra Booth was one of the people that was present as well as a doctor. Joseph took Elsa by the hand and he prayed in silence for a moment, according to Philo Dibble. And then he pronounced her arm whole in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he turned and left the room. The preacher, this is Philo Dibble talking, speaking of Ezra Booth, asked her if her arm was whole and she straightened it out and she replied, it is as good as the other arm. The question was then asked if it could remain whole. Joseph, hearing this, answered and said, it is as good as the other and as liable to accident as the other arm. The doctor who witnessed the miracle came to Philo's house the next morning and related all of this to him. And then he attempted to account for it by some other explanation. And so this is the beginnings of Philo the Devil's association with the saints. But more importantly, as it applies to this story, that experience where Ezra Booth saw Elsa's arm being healed caused him to be motivated to align himself with the saints. And so I don't want to judge him. I don't know his whole story, but this is what we do know. He goes to Zion. He's not impressed. He sees the bickering on the river on the way back. And by November of 1831, so it's August right now, he leaves. And by November, he has published documentation against the church. And he's one of the first anti-Mormon advocates. And he eventually loses all faith. He becomes an agnostic where he's like, you know, I don't even know. And so we see all kinds of people moving around in this early church, those that have faith and stay true, those that come in and then they leave. And I think, Bryce, these verses about signs, I think they could be applied to the circumstance surrounding Ezra Booth and and his experience. Yes. And I think it may be valuable to go to the Book of Mormon and talk about how signs are used in the Book of Mormon. Turn to Helaman, to Samuel the Lamanite, who's up on the wall talking to the wicked Nephites in Zarahemla. And he basically says, signs are given for many reasons, and he gives two main reasons for signs. Look at verse 12 of chapter 14, Helaman 14, 12. He says, And also that ye might know of the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning, and that you might know of the signs of his coming to the intent that you might believe. And then in verse 28 of that same chapter, chapter 14, He says, and the angel said unto me that many shall see greater than things than these to the intent that they might believe that these signs and these wonders should come to pass upon all the face of the land to the intent 
that there should be no cause for unbelief among the children of men. So written in that verse are two reasons for signs. One is to help us, to confirm our faith, to help us believe, and then to leave us without excuse. Look at verse 29, and this to the intent that whosoever will believe might be saved, and that whosoever will not believe, a righteous judgment might come upon them. In chapter 15, he gives us another one, verse 17. And now behold, saith the Lord concerning the people of the Nephites, if they will not repent and observe to do my will, I will utterly destroy them, saith the Lord, because of their unbelief, notwithstanding the many mighty works which I have done among them. In other words, those mighty works stand to leave you without excuse. So, it's not fair to just simply say we should never seek for a sign. What the Lord is saying here in section 63 is, don't seek for signs in order to build your faith upon the miracle. If your faith is built upon a miracle, it can be shattered. You must believe. You must have faith first. And then signs come to confirm your belief. That's happening all over the scriptures, that signs are given to confirm the belief of those who may need a witness and may need a confirmation of that belief. And that's not an evil thing to say, Lord, I believe, and I'm going to believe whether you confirm that belief or not, but then look for the signs that come after belief. And that's exactly what the Lord says back in section 63. Faith cometh not by signs, but signs follow those that believe. Yes, signs do follow belief, and they do confirm faith. Verse 11, signs come by faith unto mighty works. But one of the sins the Lord is calling out here is to require a sign in order to believe. You know what's interesting, Bryce? The same people can see the same sign and interpret it differently. Even, for example, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, in the text it talks about people that saw that that didn't like Jesus said, well, now we got to kill Lazarus. Yep. So in the end, I, I think what the Lord is saying is signs are awesome. They're going to build your faith, but you're going to see what you're going to see. Yeah, and we saw this earlier in the Doctrine and Covenants where the Lord told Joseph Smith, if they don't believe what's written in the book, if they don't believe the translation of the book, they would not believe even if you could show them the gold plates. Remember, you have to be a celestial people to build a celestial city. And so the Lord is now going to begin to point out some of the telestial and terrestrial things that have to be removed from the kind of people who are going to build the city of Zion. Now, telestial sins are a threat to our membership. We should not have telestial sins in the church. We should be a terrestrial people striving to become celestial. And so the Lord's going to call out three very particular telestial sins and say, these have no place in the church. You cannot do this and be a member of the church. And he's even going to say, verse 19, you are not justified because these things are among you. And we cannot, should not have telestial sins in the church. Membership in the church assumes that we are overcoming a lot of these telestial sins. So the first one he talks about is requiring a sign in order to believe. Don't require a sign in order to believe. And now verse 14, he kind of gives telestial sin number two. There were among you adulterers and adulteresses. A lot of them have left. And there's even some still in the church let such beware and repent speedily, lest judgment shall come upon them as a snare, and their folly shall be made manifest, and their works shall follow in the, them in the eyes of the people. Unrepentant adultery has no place in the church, the Lord says. Now, that doesn't mean the Lord doesn't honor repentance. He does. Yeah. The Lord honors repentance, and you can repent of adultery. But he's talking about 
those who will not repent, those who do not repent. Adultery is a telestial sin that unrepented will get you out of the church. He even says the terrestrial version of that, look at verse 16, he that looketh on a woman to lust after her. That's the terrestrial version of the sin. You're not committing adultery, but you are in your heart. You won't have the spirit, and you will deny the faith and fear. So this is Bright Howard W. Hunter. He says, Be faithful in your marriage, covenants, and thought, word, and deed. Pornography, flirtations, and unwholesome fantasies erode one's character and strike at the foundation of a happy marriage. Unity and trust within marriage are thereby destroyed. One who does not control his thoughts and thus commits adultery in his heart, if he does not repent, shall not have the spirit, but shall deny the faith and shall fear. And here's Brigham Young quoting Joseph Smith. Joseph said that the elders of Israel would receive more temptations, be more buffeted, and have greater difficulty to escape the evil thrown in their way by females than by any other means. I think that's a clear reference to sexual temptations, not that females are evil. This is one of Satan's most powerful auxiliaries with which to weaken the influence of the ministers of Christ and bring them down from their high position and calling into darkness, shame, and disgrace. You will have to guard more strictly against that than against any other evil that may beset you. That's from the two first prophets of this church. You will have to guard more against sexual temptations than against any other evil that may beset you. And those of you who have been endowed, you know that of all the commandments in the law of the gospel, the Lord highlights and calls one of them out. He says, you got to obey the law of the gospel. But then he pulls one specifically out and says, you've got to obey the law of chastity. That clearly, we all need to understand, has heightened scrutiny in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because the Lord is simply saying, we will never be a Zion people if we are struggling with immoral transgressions like sexual temptations. Yeah. Let's do one more. So we've got three celestial sins the Lord is calling out that have no place in the church. Number one, seeking a sign in order to believe. Number two, he talks about adultery. Now number three, verse 17, he kind of clumps a whole lot of celestial sins together. Wherefore, I, the Lord, have said that the fearing and the unbelieving and all liars and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie and the whoremonger and the sorcerer shall have their part in that lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. I think it's that phrase, loveth and maketh a lie, that I would draw attention to. Deliberate deceivers who enjoy the deception, who loveth and maketh a lie. That's a celestial type of a transgression. Don't be the kind of people who are out to deliberately deceive. You know, Bryce, uh, probably 30 years ago, I read a book by M. Scott Peck called People of the Lie, and Peck is a psychologist, and the whole book is talking about that, how people can get so caught up in their deception of how they perceive reality to the point where they don't even know they're doing it, and everything is a misrepresentation of truth, which then leads to mental illness. And then he proceeds to give all these accounts of people that have kind of gone down these paths and gone down into what I would call paths of madness, essentially, where their their mental psyche is broken because they've gone down these paths. And I think about that with the adversary. He probably knows, he, you know, he knows what he's doing, that he's doing it wrong, but he's lied to himself so many times that he becomes what Peck would call one of the people of the lie. And I think really it's just this invitation for us to be mentally and spiritually healthy. And I think what I find interesting also is people that are really busy doing this don't even know they're doing it. I doubt they even sit and think about it. It fascinates me what Korahor says, that an angel came to him and told him a lie. And he believed it. And then he taught it because it was pleasing to the carnal mind. It became his truth. And then he says, the more I taught it the more I believed it was true. 
What verse is that? That's in Alma 30, 53. That's a really good cross-reference, 30, 53. And I just think that happens, that we're presented with a lie that's carnally pleasing, and we teach that lie, we embrace the lie, and then the lie becomes us. Yeah. And we become deceivers. So those are really clear three sins on celestial. So Yeah, notice what he does in the rest of the section. He just says, but that's not all. Not only do we have to rid ourselves of the violence and the adultery and the telestial-like sins, but if you're going to build a celestial city, you have to be a celestial people. And so now he's going to call out three terrestrial sins. You know, Bryce, I see three steps. We're in Egypt, Israel, Old Testament, right? They're living the world. Then we bring them out. We're living like the gospel. We're trying to root that stuff out of our hearts, but that's not enough, is it? We want to build Zion. So it's like this third level. Do you see the kind of that paradigm yeah. working? Remember how the Old Testament tabernacle kind of had a telestial, terrestrial, celestial shift to it? Yeah, space. Come out of the telestial outer courtyard, come into the holy place, which is the terrestrial. And then there's one more invitation, come out of the terrestrial and into the celestial. So once the Lord rebukes a bunch of telestial sins, watch him rebuke several terrestrial sins. So verse 54 is now a plea to be the celestial people we need to be in order to build Zion. Verse 54, he says, until that hour, now we'll talk about the millennial references here in a minute, but until that hour, there will be foolish virgins among the wise. So one terrestrial sin he keeps referring to is that of being a foolish virgin. Now, if you'll go back to section 45, do you remember we talked about the 10 virgins in section 45? There was a reference to them. And the Lord identified, verse 57, he says, They that are wise and have received the truth have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide. So one of the things he's rebuking in section 63 is not following the Holy Ghost, relying more on the arm of flesh and less on the Spirit in order to guide your life. That's a terrestrial challenge that we have to overcome. We have to take the Holy Ghost as our guide. We have to be guided by the Spirit like the five wise virgins. In, right back to that space, when you mentioned leaving the courtyard, remember the sea, yeah. and then you're in the holy place, you're living, you're eating the bread, you have the bread of the presence, but the goal is to come into the holy place. That place is called the Devir, which is where we get the Devarim, the words. The words come out of the place of speaking. So it's all tied into listening to the words of the Lord. And then we're back to how do we pray? And Remember President Packer talking about true prayer is a revelation where we're told by the Lord what to pray for. And even in the tabernacle, okay, so you come out of the courtyard, which represents the telestial. You got to go through the altar of sacrifice and the laver. So you got to give up the natural man and wash yourself clean and come into the holy place. And once you're inside the holy place of the tabernacle, there's a menorah, there's the incense, and then there's the bread and wine. In other words, in order to come out of the terrestrial and into the celestial, you need to fill yourself with light. You need to offer up the prayers that are incense to God, and you need to fill your life with the bread of life. It's all there. It's all right there. And the Lord's kind of speaking about it here. If you're going to come into the celestial place, you have to be guided by the Holy Ghost. That has to be your constant companion. It doesn't mean you're not going to be mortal. We're all going to be mortal. and We're all trying. But we need to be guided by the Holy Ghost. Okay, since you just brought that up, I'm going to go here. Go to verse 20. So section 63, verse 20. Nevertheless, he that endureth in faith and doeth my will, the same shall overcome. And then verse 21, the transfiguration of the earth, it's this back to the Garden of Eden. So we're talking temple. And then you get to verse 22. And now verily I say unto you that as I said that I would make known my will unto you, behold, I will make it known unto you, not by way of commandment, 
for there are many who observe not to keep my commandments. And here's the kicker, verse 23. But unto him that keepeth my commandments, I will give the mysteries of my kingdom, and the same shall be in him, the same, what is that? The mysteries, mysterion, the stuff that I'm going to tell you that you can't repeat. It will be a well of living water springing up unto everlasting life. There's two things that Adam and Eve are told. They are to dress and to keep the garden. Th- those words are shamar and abed. Shamar is to keep and a bed is to serve. Like as a, by the way, Adam and Eve are temple priests. And what the Lord is saying to them is you need to keep the garden. In other words, you need to keep my commandments. You need to, and that word keep is to guard, but it's also to keep, but you're also to serve as temple priests. And this stuff in section 63 is tied into this idea that, okay, you're going to have the priesthood. You're going to be officiating in the temple, but it's more than that. You need to be those that keep it. And if you do, you get the mysteries. And then you have this concept of a well springing up into uh, everlasting life. The well is underground. The water is coming up forth and it's bubbling up in the Debir. That's the image I want you to have in your mind. The place of speaking, the Holy of Holies, symbolically, ritually, is on top of a well or a spring. And that's what the word Navi means. Prophet is one who bubbles up. He's bubbling up the words of life. And so 23 is all temple. 20 through 23 is all of this, where the Lord is essentially saying, you've got to be a keeper. So what happens to Cain? When the Lord speaks to Cain... Cain is serving. He's in a bed, but he's like, I'm not a Shamar. I'm not going to be my brother's keeper. And that idea of people that are doing temple things, they're abetting, but they're not Shamaring is a major theme of the Old Testament. And that's where Isaiah stands up and says, you guys are in the temple, but you're doing it wrong. Lehi stands up and says, you guys are using the temple, but you're doing it wrong. And so Joseph is trying to put it back. Joseph Smith as a prophet is saying, no, we've got to say the words and do the things, but we have to keep the commandments. And Bryce, I really see that in connection to everything you're saying here about celestial sins, got to get rid of them. And then, oh, there's more. You got to get rid of the terrestrial sins. Yeah. And all of that is symbolized by the five wise virgins, as opposed to the five foolish virgins. The five wise virgins have a well within them. In the language of the Book of Mormon, they feast upon the fruit until they are filled, and they hunger not, neither do they thirst. That's right there. And so all of this is just kind of saying, okay, get out of the telestial, and you need to, as you transition from terrestrial to celestial, be a wise virgin, fill your life with light so that you have revelation in your heart that God is speaking to you. So let's get to the second terrestrial sin. So number one, we talked about don't be a foolish virgin. Number two, he rebukes Sidney Rigdon for the way he described Zion. Now, Mike talked about that in our in our earlier podcast, that Sidney Rigdon was given the assignment to write a description of Zion, and he saw simply the ordinariness of the land, the plainness. He didn't see the vision. He stayed with the lowly and didn't let his sight go up to the higher. And so I think one of the things the Lord is saying is don't be like Sidney Rigdon. See the vision. See the big picture. Everything we do in life needs to be seen in terms of plan of salvation and God's purposes. Things like gay marriage or any of the modern issues, racism and those things, need to be seen in terms of the big picture vision of God's purposes. You have to see the vision. You have to hold it to that bigger picture and not just keep it. Uh, you know, Sidney Rigdon was looking at the land, and, and no one could argue that what he was describing wasn't true. Yeah. He was describing the land as it was, not the land as it could be and should be and will be someday. That lens of celestial vision, I think, is how we also need to see each other yes. as people. Yes. You've got it. We have to look at each other. We have to look at marriage, for example, in terms of the celestial vision. Children, 
and what we do with our children, raising our children, going to church, reading the scriptures, everyday life, having a job, occupation. We have to have, back to the imagery that we've seen in section 27 about the armor of God, we have to have the helmet of salvation on our head that guides what we see and what we think about. You know, Bryce, I used to judge my mom when I was young. For a long time, she was a single parent. And I remember one day in my 30s, everything shifted because I was raising my kids and I was broken. I couldn't do it. And I realized I have Sonia. She's amazing. I couldn't imagine doing it by myself. And every, it was like something changed in my vision. I think that's kind of what you're talking about, how, exact. we see, how we see people and things and everything, right? Yeah. Sidney Rigdon saw the plainness of the land and didn't see the land through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of God, through the perspective of eternity. And that seems to be kind of the terrestrial sin the Lord's calling out here to all of us, is don't see life through the perspective of mortality alone. Don't see death through the perspective of mortality. Don't see commandments or the word of wisdom, or anything that the Lord gives us through the perspective of just the land. You've got to see the vision of Zion in it. That's a great application. You've got to see the big picture and the eternal perspective. All right, terrestrial sin number three, from verses 58 through 64, he talks about taking the Lord's name in vain. And even members of the church are taking the Lord's name in vain and they don't even realize it. He says in verse 61, let all men beware how they take my name in their lips. For behold, verily I say that many there be who are under this condemnation. And don't you think by extension, he's also talking about us today, that in the church today, there are many who are under this condemnation who use the name of God and use it in vain having not authority. Let the church repent of their sins, and I, the Lord, will own them. Otherwise, they will be cut off. This is something we've got to repent of. Remember that which cometh from above is sacred and must be spoken with care and by constraint of the Spirit. And in this there is no condemnation. I mean, we all think of swearing as one way to take his name in vain. But there's so many ways. When you partake of the sacrament, you take upon you his name. If you have no intention to act like him, you are taking his name in vain. I think that's more in line with the ancient view of that. It wasn't necessarily saying his name in, in anger, although the Jews were really careful when they said it. They would take the tetragrammaton and they would say Adonai instead of Yahweh. I really think what it means is I'm not going to use God or religion for compulsion or to promote things that are bad. So Martin Luther, for example, he saw some of the things in his day and he's like, you guys are using the name of God wrong. You're promoting practices which are contrary to his interpretation of Holy Scripture. And Bryce, I really think the end of verse 62 is talking about a lot of people and the Lord just kind of leaves it there for you to think about. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot here to ponder this week. Do I possibly take the Lord's name in vain? I don't swear. The one thing I want to just mention about this is the idea of compulsion. Yeah. I don't think the Savior is into compulsion, and I think if we use Scripture or religion or those kinds of things to force, I think that's an easy one to say, you know what, that's using His name in vain. Yeah. And I, I want to remind everyone that the Melchizedek priesthood is not called the Melchizedek priesthood. The true name of the priesthood is the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. But out of respect or reverence to the name of the Supreme Being, and to avoid the too frequent repetition of his name, they changed it to Melchizedek. Do we have that respect or reverence to the name and the character and the identity of the Supreme Being. This week ought to cause us to reflect 
Am I guilty of any of these terrestrial sins? Am I not fully taking the Spirit as my guide as I should? Am I not seeking the light as much as I could? President Nelson has been pleading with the church to claim our privileges of personal revelation. He keeps saying, do whatever you have to do to have revelation. Pay the spiritual price to be a wise virgin. The second one, do you see from an eternal perspective in all that we do, or do you just simply see the plainness of the land like Sidney saw? And do you take the Lord's name in vain, not just by what you say, but who you are and what you do and your commitment to following him? Do you have reverence and respect for the things of God? Even in the way we treat each other and we treat his children, do you respect them? My father taught me a wonderful lesson in my childhood that I don't know that he intended to teach at the time, but it changed my life. I was born between two sisters who shared a room, and they would cover their beds with stuffed animals, and every animal had its certain place on the bed. Now, a little boy, you can understand, that would drive a little boy crazy, so I would go in there and I would mess up their animals. And my dad imposed a rule that changed my life. He said, in this family, everyone has to treat things not the way you value them, but the way the owner of that thing values them. So he said, Bryce, you have to treat those animals the way your sisters treat them. And the opposite was true. My sisters had to treat my things the way I valued them. And what I realized that my dad was teaching me is that I have to treat God's things the way God treats them. Otherwise, I risk taking his name in vain. I just remind you of that last verse as you think about these things. Remember that which cometh from above is sacred and must be spoken, and I think treated, with care, and by constraint of the Spirit. So, three celestial sins, three terrestrial sins, let's be a celestial people. Now, the rest of section 63 is kind of a precursor to the coming of what is section 1. So, section 63 is August of 31. In November of 31, we're going to hold a conference. We're going to ask the question, what do we do with the revelations that Joseph Smith has received? And there's going to be a whole lot of debate about it. And there's going to be some negative feelings. But the Lord's going to make it very clear that he intended these revelations to be printed because the Lord's going to reveal what is to you and I section one of the Doctrine and Covenants. It does not come first. It is about the 66th, 67th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. It comes at that conference in November of 1831, and it begins with our message to the world. And section one says, you need to help me save the world because a lot of people are going to be destroyed. Now, the reason they're going to be destroyed is because the earth is changing. Now, as you read section 63, watch for that message, at least the preliminary version of that message. Starting in verse 20, he talks about the transfiguration of the earth. And if you haven't endured in faith, you will be destroyed at the transfiguration of the earth. The earth is going to change from a telestial world that we have today to a terrestrial world that we will enjoy during the millennium. Now, who can dwell on the telestial world of today? A telestial earth can see celestial people, terrestrial people, and telestial people on it. But when this earth transitions into a terrestrial planet during the millennium, what kind of people can dwell on a terrestrial planet? Only celestial and terrestrial. That means everything that is telestial today has two choices between now and the millennium. Change or be destroyed. Now you go back and read the first part of section one and you'll hear that message. 
the Lord wants us to help them change. He opens up the Doctrine and Covenants with hearken. The telestial part of all of us needs to either change or be destroyed. So verse 17 of section 1, knowing the calamities that are coming and wanting to prevent them, I called upon my prophet Joseph Smith. And hence, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is to help the world change. You know, Bryce, this is called the Cosmic Covenant. There's these three chapters in the middle of Isaiah, Isaiah 24, 25, 26-ish. There's this idea that the Cosmic Covenant is this deal between the Creator and the created. And if we keep our end, then we'll have this Garden of Eden-type world. Read Isaiah 24, 4 through 6. Read Ezekiel 34, 24 through 31, and then go back and read section 1, verse 16, 17, and 18. The idea is essentially the world is broken, and the Lord's going to heal it. If you walk in his way, the Lord's, and not your own, section 63, verse 2 is anger is kindled against the wicked and rebellious, and he'll take whom he will take. Verse 6, let the wicked take heed. By the way, verse 1, look, he kind of castigates him there in verse 1. He says, you call yourselves the people of the Lord. Well, are you? you got to keep your end of the covenant, right? Your end of the bargain. He's going to call out a whole lot of sins that need to change just to become a terrestrial people. And he rebukes us in verse 19 by saying, these things are among you. And they can't be among you if we're going to be a terrestrial people and dwell on a terrestrial planet. Now, Here's some fun facts. What if you're dead when he comes? What if you've lived a good life and you die? Verse 49. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, when the Lord shall come and old things shall pass away and all things become new, they shall rise from the dead and shall not die after and shall receive an inheritance before the Lord in the holy city. So if you're dead when he comes, you'll be resurrected at his coming. Well, what if you're alive when he comes? What if you're on the covenant path when he comes? Verse 50, now this is kind of fun. He that liveth when the Lord shall come, and hath kept the faith. See, there's the precursor, there's the requirement. Blessed is he. Nevertheless, it is appointed to him to die at the age of man. Now, the Doctrine and Covenant says age of man. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 20, calls the age of man 100. I'll just, you take that for whatever it's worth. Or like in Third Nephi, where Jesus says that they'll live to 70. I don't know what the age is, but Isaiah suggests the age of 100. You continue to live until that age, and then you die and are resurrected as fast as you can blink your eye. Maybe 100 is the new 70. Maybe. Maybe we're doing that. Because I know 30 is the new 20. I love it. So listen to what happens. If you're alive when Jesus comes, you will be transfigured into a heightened mortal state. Children shall grow up until they become old. Old men shall die, but they shall not sleep in the dust, but they shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And then you don't go down into the grave. You don't go into a casket. You're not cremated. So one moment you're mortal and one moment you're immortal. But that's kind of some fun stuff about the millennium. Now, getting there is what's key, is building up Zion. And so this whole section comes down to verse 24. And now behold, this is the will of the Lord your God concerning the saints, that they should assemble themselves together unto the land of Zion. Not in haste, lest there should be confusion. Now, in section 105, the Lord pushes the pause button on Zion. So if I could take a little liberty and come back to section 63 in light of the pause, I think the Lord is saying, this is the will of the Lord your God concerning his saints. 
we need to be doing the things necessary to become the kind of people that can pick that baton back up and build Zion. It is the will of God today that we become a Zion people. Now, in their day, the Lord says in 25 through the end, you got to buy the land. I love verse 25, and it's still true today in 2021. I, the Lord, hold Zion in mine own hands. Nevertheless, I, the Lord, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You have to purchase the land. Verse 29, the land of Zion shall only be obtained by purchase or by blood. If it's by purchase, then great. Verse 31, if it's by blood, inasmuch as you are forbidden to shed blood, that means it's your blood that's being shed and your enemies are upon you and you'll be scourged. Now that's kind of a foreshadowing of exactly what happened in Jackson County. That blood was shed. But in the meantime, now that the Lord has pushed the pause button, we need to become the kind of people he's asking us to become. We need to preach the gospel and get bigger. We need to build temples so that we can make and keep temple covenants and become better. And if we become bigger and better, someday we will, he will push the unpause button and we will pick that baton back up and we will purchase those lands and we will render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But in the meantime, the call to action in section 63 is get rid of the celestial and terrestrial things that are holding us back from being a celestial people that we need to be. Yep. Excellent. You know, Bryce, I really like verse 49, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. And we see that again in 63.3, that the Lord willeth to take even them whom he will take and preserve in life them whom he will preserve. And I can't help but see this as possibly an allusion to Polly Knight, who dies in August of 1831. She's going to be the first of many saints who are going to die in Missouri and then later in Nauvoo. And I think that's one of the questions that the saints are going to have is, You know, how do I put this into context? And I love how the Lord says, I take whom I take and I preserve a life whom I will preserve. Just because someone dies young doesn't mean that the Lord took them. But he clearly is alluding to, in my mind, verse 49 of Polly's blessed state. Another verse, verse 39, Titus Billings. Titus Billings was a stonemason. And according to tradition, he was the second person baptized in Kirtland. And he was among the first appointed by Revelation to go down and move to Jackson County. And he did everything that the Lord told him to do. He sold his acreage that he was asked to sell. And he moved all the way down to Jackson County in the spring of 1832. And if you follow his life, he was always doing the things that the Lord asked him to do. He became a counselor to Edward Partridge. He eventually fought in the Battle of Crooked River. And he saw what happened to David W. Patton. He fled to Lima and then to Nauvoo, and then he went west with the saints. We went with the Heber C. Kimball Company all the way to Utah, and eventually he was one of the first houses uh, that was built in Manti, Utah. So Titus Billings is one of those people that we don't necessarily talk about a lot in the church. We talk about Ezra Booth, but on the other end of the spectrum, you have Titus Billings. And then look at verse 42. We've talked about him before, but you also have Newell K. Whitney. And so I like how this section of the Doctrine and Covenants has both ends of the spectrum of the kinds of people that are brought into the church. And the invitation is to all of them and to us to build Zion. It's a beautiful section. So another thing I just want to draw your attention to is verse 34. So the wars, the wicked are killing the wicked. Verse 34, the saints shall hardly escape. If you tie this in, to a cross reference, which is First Nephi twenty two sixteen through seventeen, it talks about that the Lord won't suffer that the wicked will destroy the righteous, and the Lord will preserve the righteous even by His power, even if it so be by fire. And these are once again kind of contraries that we're proving. On one hand, the Lord says the saints will hardly escape. On the other hand, He says that the wicked will destroy the wicked. But if you think about this, Lehi and his family were preserved when they left. The saints, by and large, were preserved from the Civil War. Well, going back to verse 33, the way the end works isn't that good defeats evil. 
It's that evil defeats evil. We got to understand the world is not going to end by good defeating evil. The world is going to end by the wicked slain, the wicked. Yeah. But in the 1838 war in Missouri, many saints died. And many saints died in Nauvoo. And there was actually a Nauvoo war where people brought in cannon and they shelled the saints. And some of the poorer saints had to cross the river in complete destitution. And it was very rough for many of them. And so they're almost like these contradictory passages. And then you get into one of my favorite stories of Christian history has to do with the prediction in Jerusalem right around 66 AD, about four years before the Roman legions came and destroyed so many people, the Christians were warned to leave to Pella. Now they left to other places, but Pella is probably the most famous place where they left. And we put in the show notes some great commentary from early Christian historians talking about this. And basically three main elements, that there was this miracle that these Christians were able to escape the destruction, that they relocated to Pella, and then the subsequent destruction of Jerusalem. Surrounding these ideas is this idea of a protective God. But yet, it's we're kind of coming back to the way we started the podcast. There's this God in heaven, and the saints are being invited to the top of the mountain, but we live at the base. All of us live our lives in the messiness of mortality. And so I like to take verse 34 as, it's not only that we're going to hardly escape historically in the context of the wars that they're going to face, but we're hardly going to escape the vicissitudes of life. Saints get cancer. Teenagers crash cars. We have to pay taxes. And we all are going to die at some point, every one of us. And our faith in Christ is not going to take away the sea of chaos in mortality. And so these contraries, there, there is truth through both of them. And I see it as the Lord working with the saints. We can't have the Lord come to his people if there is no people, if there is no Zion. So clearly Zion will get built, but it doesn't mean that the saints are going to be preserved from all things. And it also doesn't mean that some of us won't fall by the wayside. But I think the important thing is what he says very next, nevertheless, I will be among them. So yes, we do get cancer and we do crash cars, but the Lord is with us. And maybe in some of the winding up scenes and the catastrophes that are coming, some really good people are going to suffer and be affected, but the Lord will be with them. And I remind you that he says, blessed are they that die in the Lord. I will resurrect them. They will be with me. As saints, we have him with us. It doesn't mean we're going to be exempt from the suffering as he comes, but he will be with us and he will help us. Beautiful. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. We will see you next time when we cover sections 64 through 66. Thanks for sharing your day with us today, and we hope that in some way this has built your faith, and we'll see you next week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.